So many of us today have heard about Omicron and there have been jokes that it is it from a Transformer movie? What is it? Well, we know now it's a variant and it's causing concern around the world. Today, we have a panel of experts. We have Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner, who's a senior director of GBAC. And we have Patty Olinger, who's the executive director of GBAC. And also Dr. John Lowe, who's with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So today we're going to dig into this and get your thoughts. So let's start with you, uh, John. What are some of your top concerns with this variant? Yes, I'd say my, my top two concerns with this variant are uh, transmissibility, so how easily this variant spreads from one person to other people. Uh, and then the other is, is immune escape or vaccine escape. And, and so when we think about escape, we think about uh, we have immunity from natural infection. We've been prior infected and we have a level of protection against future infection. We have immunity now available from vaccines. Um, and so what is the landscape as it relates to this variant on immune protection from those different sources of, of immunity? Um, I, I do think that that transmissibility is one of the things that at this point appears to be really remarkable for Omicron, where, uh, you know, in, over the last year, the, the Delta variant came out really out of nowhere and became almost the only variant of coronavirus that we see globally. Uh, so very remarkable to see Omicron can't come out of uh, almost nowhere. It really wasn't popping up on any surveillance radars. And in the span of about two weeks, it became the, the primary uh, strain in South Africa to where it was accounting for over 80 percent of the cases that they were tracking. So how is it doing that? Uh, and, and does that change kind of how we tackle it in terms of prevention? And Patty, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, I, well, John really, you know, talked about, you know, the, those real concerns that we're seeing from a scientific standpoint. You know, my whole career has been to support those researchers, those frontline folks, the physicians that are at the front lines working and dealing and responding to outbreaks and pandemics as we're seeing with COVID-19. And as a bioris management professional and a biosafety officer, a former biosafety officer, it's one of those things that how do I protect people as they're working and as we're looking at just working even day-to-day -day life. And one of the things that I, I hope that people will remember is that we need to start ensuring that what we're putting in place is building resilience, making sure that we have scalable responses no matter what, because this is not the last variant that we will see, nor is it the last virus outbreak that we'll see. Um, and so making sure that we look at the things that we can control to be able to protect ourselves, our families and our communities to me is something that we have to continue to discuss, educate and accept um, as we're moving forward. And Gavin? Yeah, I think what we've seen right now is something that has to change and has to change very, very quickly. When a country, any country, the government of that country is open, they, they're transparent, they tell the truth. They said, we found a new variant and it did this. And then what the rest of the world do? They penalize them. And then we've got to flip that switch. We've got to do a whole 180 degree turn on this and say, hang on, South Africa, you've got good capacity there. You've had many other infectious diseases that you have been fighting and dealing with for many years. You've got good lab capacity. You've got good contact tracing. Open, being open and transparent is something that should be rewarded and not, and, and not penalized. And that if we're going to move forward and get out of this pandemic and beat this SARS-CoV-2 virus, we have to encourage more transparency. And what we just saw in the last week or so, Jeff, was, oh, you told the truth and we, we stopped flying to your country. Or we did this. That's got to change. The other, the other challenge I have is my Greek alphabet was not as good as I thought it was. Um, with Omicron, I really got tested here. But the point I'm trying to say is that as we see these new variants and we give them names using such like the Greek alphabet, it's the same virus. It's still SARS-CoV-2 that causes, this is the virus that causes COVID-19. And so many questions I've been fielding in the last week is, well, is it still an envelope virus? Yes, it is. It's the same virus. And that's a big challenge. It's not a new virus. It's the same virus. And again, we, as Patty said, we just follow the same 
things, the same methodologies, the same um, mitigation solutions that we've done now for nearly two years, that's going to keep us infection, uh, free from infection. So a headline I saw today caught my eye. It said that if the world isn't vaccinated, there may be no end to variants. It's kind of a scary thought that if you so basically it looks like a guarantee that we're seeing in the news. You get the shot, the vaccine's going to die. What do you have to say to that? Is that something we could really um, put a guarantee on, John? Yeah, so um, it, it will definitely drastically knock down the number of variants that we see if we have more people with uh, protection against uh, the virus. And what we know is that here's what immunity does, right? So immunity gives us protection on, on the front level against, you know, whether or not we get infected. That's kind of the first line of defense. Um, it's, it's not foolproof, though. So, and, and we're seeing this with what has been called breakthrough infections. So people that have had prior infection or vaccinated still getting infected and sick. And so then there's a second wave of immunity, right, that comes on really through T cells and, and helps prevent severe illness or hospitalization. Um, and what we know is that when you have a level of immunity, the, the, the length of time that the virus is in your body and able to replicate and generate more viruses to infect other people or to make you ill is reduced when you have immunity. So uh, our best shot at, at limiting the production of the virus at large and ultimately the production of variants is, is to get everybody immune. Um, the, the worst strategy to getting everybody immune is to let everybody infected. The cost of human life that will come with that uh, has already been astronomical. Um, we see you know, counts of confirmed COVID deaths worldwide are, are pretty staggering. They're about, at about 5 million right now. Um, but those are, those are deaths that have met a pretty high bar for classification as a COVID death. And the other indicator that we watch are, are excess deaths. And unfortunately, ex excess deaths for the period of time that we've had COVID are actually three times the number of deaths that we've counted for COVID. So the strategy to just let everyone get infected will have immense costs economically on our healthcare systems globally and, and on human life as well. So um, yes, we're likely to see COVID for a long time. Uh, we'd like to limit uh, the, the number of COVID variants that we see and the number of people that get infected with, with COVID through vaccination. Absolutely. Let's talk about tracking. Um, you know, the United States has its way of tracking these variants, other countries. Can we learn from others? What do you think about that? Maybe we'll start with you, Patty. Well, I mean, tracking, I mean, I think it comes into testing. I mean, one of the things from a testing standpoint that we can do is ensure that um, if we're going to be in, in, in visiting, let's say, grandma over the holidays, test before you go. Um, the whole tracking and testing is up to the different countries. And Gavin has really been looking at a lot of this very closely um, when we hear about, okay, I've tested positive, but are they really looking at the variant structure? Are they doing the sequencing at that point in time? And that doesn't happen every time. I mean, think about the fact that, you know, you may go to, you know, the grocery store, or the, the, pharma the pharmacy, and you pick up a test kit, you get tested. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting that sequenced. And so, being able to pick off those variants is something that is important and each country does it at different levels and each country has different capacities to do that. Um, Gavin, what are your thoughts on this? Because I know that you've been looking at this very closely. I'm a little surprised, Patty. You know, John, you and I have all been involved in the Ebola cases. We mm -hmm. saw how how, how well done uh, contact tracing was done. You know, I remember when I was in West Africa, our first three cases led to 891 people that were defined as close contacts that we then had to follow for 21 days. And we had the resources to do that. We actually leveraged university students to help us with the contact tracing. We went to scale. We've done it for hepatitis A outbreaks. We've done it for measles outbreaks. Suddenly we get back to 
COVID-19, we're going, well, what, what's wrong with our contact tracing? Why did it work so well for these other diseases, but not now? And why are, why are people sort of hesitant to use an app on a cell phone or some other uh, electronic means to share data? What, what's going on in the society? I'm not really sure. But the, the important thing is now is that you're absolutely right, Patty, we're, we're, we're the, the governments of many countries now are being targeted um, and, and being very strategic when it comes to with limited resources. Where do we take samples? How do we analyze them? We, and I think everyone's doing probably a pretty good job. It could be better, but it, we are, again, we live in the real world where we are limited by resources. So what are we looking for in the next few days, maybe the next week? What kind of data would interest you three? Uh, what, what do you want to see? What do you fear? That's a tough question. Yeah, so, yeah I can start. I, what we're really anticipating the the immunity data on Omicron, and that, that generally takes about two weeks to generate in a lab to tell us uh, the level of protection that we get against this Omicron variant from vaccine. And they're going to look at all of the vaccines that are available, and, and they're going to try to characterize, is Omicron better at working around some vaccines versus other? And also characterize uh, the ability of Omicron to work around immunity from prior infection. So what we've heard mainly through word of mouth, through, through stories from South Africa, is that initially it sounds like Omicron is pretty effective in infecting individuals that have just had prior infection but not necessarily vaccinated. Uh, what we don't know, there doesn't seem to be any really great data on what's happening in people that have prior vaccination. So there's lab studies being done right now and those, those are gonna be translated. That's gonna be really important. Um, I think the other piece, getting back to that transmissibility that we're, we're likely not to see in the next two weeks, but it would be great if we could. Um, if you recall with the Delta variant, there was really great data pretty early on the level of virus that people were producing and putting out into the environment and how many days they were doing that. So that's gonna be an important thing to understand. Are people putting out high levels of Omicron variant into the environment for three days, for five days, for 15? That can be a pretty important factor for how we mitigate the spread of, of this particular variant. And that's a really good point, John, that you've raised there. Um, we, again, all of us are sitting on the edge of our seat waiting for more data. Um, but what's really interesting that's come out really early on now from those, um, those patients' reports from South Africa is there might be a change in some of the symptoms. Uh, we, we saw uh, the report that came out just recently, uh, only a few days ago, uh, a lot of the first cases were men in their age, you know, age groups of 20 to 30 year old. Um, they didn't have a lot of the, some of the symptoms that we saw with Delta, they had fatigue and they had muscle ache. And they interviewed one patient and he said, oh, I felt like I got hit by a truck. And then the, the, the actual Minister of Health said, well, it's a mild case. Well, hang on, if, you, if, if the patient says I've been hit by a truck, <laughs> that means something to me. We're using this terminology to describe these diseases now like COVID-19. Mild means it doesn't cause death. That's my interpretation. And so mild might be knocking you out for a while. And we still are very concerned what we've seen previously from previous variants of this, what we call long COVID, this, these symptoms. I live in a, an area here of Northwest Washington, DC. We've had over 200 cases in my neighborhood and I have a number of close neighbors and friends that still say, I just don't feel right today. And that's part of their long COVID symptoms. And we're really concerned what that's going to cause in the future. So again, a lot of information is gonna come out, Jeff. Um, we're still learning it. The problem is everyone wants to be in a just-in-time economy and they want information today. And it's really hard to say, we just don't know. But it, as, as, as John said, it'll be here in two, two to three weeks. So those are great points by Gavin. I, I think he also brings to mind another really important uh, thing for people to just be aware of, and this should allay fears, is that we don't anticipate Omicron to require vastly different medical treatment. So all of the, all of the methods for treating patients with, with COVID-19 uh, are anticipated to remain the same and to remain uh, effective. We, we will expect that we'll look at, there's uh, been widely used monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies that have been developed that can help isolate the virus. And so that's one area that uh, 
laboratory studies are being conducted already to make sure that what's available on the market is still effective. But by and large, all of the other medicines and, and approaches to clinical care should be uh, should still remain the primary m modes of treatment of, of this illness. So th thinking of that, uh, Patty, maybe you can touch on this. The cleaning industry, should they change what they're doing or keep doing what they're doing? Well, they need to keep doing what they're doing. But, you know, Gavin and I, you know, this last week, since we've started hearing about Omicron, we, we get calls just like what you said, should we change what we're doing? Oh my goodness, what's going on? Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, as you know, our membership at ISSA has manufacturers, distributors, we have business owners, we have service providers, just a, a wide range of different disciplines. And the article that I wrote uh, recently, the virus doesn't care and it never will, really is, is you know, at heart here. We have the tools from a standpoint of our businesses and our cleaning industry and our facilities that are, you know, that we've worked with through GBAC Star and our Star our service providers. And those are, those are messages, just as John indicated with clinical care, are not going to change with this variant. Number one, get vaccinated. We need to ensure that people are getting vaccinated. Number two, wear your mask. When it counts, wear your mask. Uh, when you're out in public and you're in crowded, especially as we're going into the holiday season and through this winter season, what we used to call the flu season, <laughs> um, is wear your mask. Keep your distance. Um, you know, assessing the ability of your facility as business owners, indoor air quality um, considerations, your facility's ventilation systems. We need to ensure that they're working properly. Maybe you need to upgrade your, your filters. You know, do you need to add filtration? Do you need to add some type of air treatment of some sort? Um, increase the turnover rates. Wash our hands. I mean, you know, think about how many times all of us have washed our hands in this last year, making sure that we continue to do that. Those messages, hand sanitizer, if you can't, um, is really important. And for here, you know, I mean, yes, we're the cleaning industry, but cleaning and disinfecting high touch points in our facilities is extremely important. And using those new technologies that we see with electrostatic sprayers or other things, um, you know, understanding um, where that is, getting educated as you're doing here, listening to this, and as well as test. Test when it matters, if you're going to go see grandma or if you're gonna hold a meeting, um, you know, in close contact with a bunch of folks, um, test where it, where it matters. <laughs>